What is up guys and welcome to the final part of my three-part series on how I coach Cubers using Max Park as a case study. So in the previous video we looked at an average of five or I guess average of four from Max Park at a Bruin Cube Day 2018 and after critiquing this average alone if I was going to make three suggestions for improvement this is what I would suggest and this is what all of my 50 USD improvement plans include. I do three areas of your solve that I think you should work on and outline how you work on them. And this, in my opinion, is the real juicy part of my analysis service and why I charge 50 USD instead of something like 10 USD, which I think, you know, that little reconstruction breakdown thing I did, that's not really worth more than like 10 bucks, honestly. Um, of course they are, you know, it's useful to go through and pick out little tricks and ideas that are relating to your actual solves that you can think about in real time, but ultimately it doesn't really give you any actual framework to refer back to, and in my opinion it's about as useful as watching an example solve video, honestly. Like, you get little tips and tricks, but you don't really get like the whole framework of what you should be doing most of the time. And this is something that I think is important for people who have limited practice time, especially people only have like two or three hours a day to pra- only two or three, but you get the idea. If you only have a limited time to practice, I think it's good to know the best ways to practice relative to your goals, and for most people your goal is just to be as fast as possible. So, bottom line, the reconstructions are not what I charge 50 USD for. What I charge 50 USD for is ultimately the improvement plan with the three suggestions, or what I like to call the three-phase improvement plan. These three suggestions are what I consider three parts of your solve that you would see the most reliable improvement from, and when I say most reliable improvement, I mean that the amount of practice that you would put into a certain aspect of your solve and the amount of practice needed to implement it would justify the amount of improvement you would receive from implementing said advice. So let's unpack that because that was a pretty, uh, that was a wordful. Uh, in layman's terms, I guess, if there's a bunch of things or a bunch of aspects of your solve that could take a similar amount of time to correct, for example, extreme things like switching to CN or like, I don't know, something something that just takes a similar amount of time. Between those two things, I will choose the one that yields the most improvement. So let's say your options are spend like three months to learn CN or spend, I don't know, three months to learn ZBLL. Depending on what level your solves are at, the three months it takes to learn CN may or may not yield better time results depending on your speed. If you're a bit slower, I would almost definitely say it would, whereas if you average, say, I don't know, sub seven, um, you know, you may be better off learning ZBLL because the other thing is the faster you are, the harder it is generally to implement CN. So that's just one example. And then on the flip side, if there's a bunch of aspects of your solve that would lead to a similar time drop, so let's say a bunch of things that would all drop your solve by one second, my strategy is to choose the thing that I think would be the easiest and quickest to implement into your solves. So although you get the same time drop, it doesn't take you as long to implement it. So that's more or less the thought that goes behind the three suggestions that I give people in my improvement plans. But anyways, here is my three most useful tips that I would give to Max Park based on the average that we went through in the previous episode. Bearing in mind that I usually don't critique official solves because people tend to solve a bit safer than they would at home, as well as potentially having nerves make them either turn faster than normal, pause more than normal, turn less accurately than normal, any, any number of things that can happen in competition. So I, I generally prefer to analyze at home averages the other reason I don't typically critique official solves is because it's significantly harder to see what you're doing a lot of the time if there's bad lighting, shaky camera work, and if it's not point of view or over shoulder angled, which is somewhat rare for official solves. Usually it is filmed from the spectator point of view or there is a camera foot on the table and both of those are kind of a crappy angle to analyze from and that is why I insist on people sending me footage either point of view angled or over one shoulder, which is a lot like all of my solving videos at home. That being said, so since Max, since Max has a good mental game in terms of dealing with nerves, plus I have actual reconstructions to work with rather than trying to reconstruct in my own time, which is how I usually do my service, analyzing his official solves becomes somewhat more of an appropriate method. Uh, it's still not perfect, but once again, Max is not paying me to do this, and this is 
more a case study rather than me really... I mean, I am really trying to, you know, I guess, show how I would make Max improve, but again, he's not paying for me to do this, and I would probably give him slightly better insights if we were using unofficial solves under different conditions. But these, because of those reasons I just mentioned, this isn't actually that far off. So enough preamble, let's move on to the actual tips. So we've got three of these, and the first one is a pretty simple one. I don't think it's something that would take too long to implement, and I think the framework for how you practice it is relatively easy. So, thing number one. In my opinion, there are some, not many, but there are some minor, minor gaps in F12 knowledge where Max could be solving cases slightly better based off either the angle the pair is at or what EO Casey is dealing with. So I just think out of the four basic, you know, pillars of CFOP, so his cross, or I guess cross plus one really, his F2L, his OLL, and his PLL, I think out of those four, his F2L is probably the weakest. Um, his cross plus one is pretty good, like good enough where I don't think he would drop a significant amount of time working on it. His OLL is, there was one kind of iffy one, so I will touch on that a bit later. And his PLL, I'm, I mean, I have my own opinions about certain PLL arcs, but again, because of Max's uh, condition with his hands, it's hard for me to give real good recommendations for better OLL and PLLs. And in general, I am trusting him to use the algs that are actually the ones he can do the fastest. But yeah, out of those four, I think F12 is where he would see the most improvement given his skill set. And that's, that's saying something because his F12 is actually really good. Like, he is, no pun intended, kind of maxed out his uh, capacity for basic CFOP, in my opinion. I, I don't know how we can get much faster without doing, like, a different solving style. Like, What's he going to do? Turn faster? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from, basically. So I think if he worked on some minor gaps in his F12 knowledge, that would give him a little bit of a time bump. And yeah, so for cases that could be improved based on the angle, so for example, there was, um, I don't know what I'm doing, hang on. There we go. So it was like this F12 case, he rotated twice and you could do it like that. So for F2L cases like that where it's just angle dependent, I think the best thing he could do is check out algdb.net's F2L section. That website has a bunch of algs, but for F2L specifically, it has the 42 standard cases and people can submit their own solutions for them. And yeah, there's just a lot to read through there. And I definitely think just by reading through that alone, Max Park would pick up on a lot of... Uh, just a lot of improvements he could make on his F2L, which he could implement fairly easily in his own time. I don't think changing F12 cases is that difficult for most people. Other than that, another resource I would recommend for Max is uh, JPerm, the YouTube video... Uh, the YouTube video... The YouTube Cuba has a F12 document that not only includes uh, the 42 standard F12 cases, I think, it also includes a number of non-standard F12 cases, so things like... Basically, whenever... Um, so a standard F2L case is basically either the pieces are in the slot it needs to go to, or they're in the U layer. So cases that don't meet that criteria, for example, this is in a different slot, uh, this would be a non-standard F2L case, and JPerm has a document going over some, but not all of them, and that's another resource where I think Max could improve some of his gaps in knowledge when it comes to his F2L solving style. On top of that, another thing I would suggest that he could do to practice this is watching example solves and also checking out reconstructions on cubesolve.es, that's C-U-B-E-S-O-L-V.es. So it's just cube solves with a dot before the last two letters. But yeah, you can check out reconstructions there and also just example solve videos from fast 3 by 3 is And that's another way to just kind of passively and easily pick up on new tricks for F12. You can also pick up stuff for cross plus one as well and also different OLLs and PLLs. So that's the main reason I threw this in, because although I think he could improve a little bit for all four pillars of F12, so cross, F12, OLL, PLL, I think OLL, PLL, and cross, uh, they can be improved, but I really, really, really doubt he's going to improve more than, like, 0.3 of a second if he, like, nails practicing those three things for the next, like, 6 to 12 months, whereas F12, I think, could be a lot more beneficial short-term. 
but that's the main reason I'm including example solves and reconstructions, because you can pick up on standard and non-standard F12 cases through that, and you can also pick up on cross stuff, OLL stuff, and PLL stuff. That being said, out of the two, I think, for Max specifically, I think watching 3x3 three three example solves will be a lot more enjoyable for him. Reading through reconstructions can be kind of boring, so that's just probably like a personal twist I would add to that, but he could absolutely use both, and I think both would be useful. Now, I also mentioned earlier that sometimes Max doesn't do the best F12 solution, either dependent on the angle or also dependent on EO, so we'll touch on that a bit. I don't think Max learning a bunch of ZBLS would really help him unless he wants to learn a lot of ZBLL. And that will be something I mention later, but I have to under I have to file learning ZBLL under highly time consuming, minimal-ish reward. But that being said, we've looked at Max's solves and he very clearly does take EO into account to the extent that he doesn't want dot cases, but not to the extent where he wants full EO. Which I think makes sense for someone like Max, because if he's not using a bunch of ZBLL, all he really wants to EO for is to avoid the bad OLLs, which are generally dot cases, and then some other random ones, but you can't really account for those. Like, the best OLL cases, for the most part, all have two edges oriented, and the four edge oriented ones are... I mean, they're not that much better, but you can do other stuff with them. But, anyways, point being, lots of ZBLS wouldn't really help him, but I would still suggest Max learn some. So my suggestion here would be finding at least one alternate way to solve most of the standard F12 cases. And once again, you can find these on AlgDB. And when I say an alternate way, I want to emphasize an alternate way that affects EO in some way. So for example, um, let's see. God, I suck at setting stuff up. <laughs> um, there we go. So something like this. Now, normally people solve this pair by doing that, and that's great, but let's say... Let's say these two edges are flipped. You don't really want this all well. But, if you do this, this isn't so bad. Uh, so yeah. Da, da, da. So yeah, that's pretty much what I would recommend for Max. If you can find alternate F12 cases for a number of the standard cases where he can do a slightly different EO. That may or may not help him, however there is a catch and a condition to this. So the catch is that if you can't execute the new solution as fast as your standard solution, for example, this I can execute about as fast as the alternative, so I think that one is worth it. But if you can't execute this EO alternative as fast as your standard solution, it probably isn't worth it. Probably. It may be worth it, but like 9 times out of 10 it won't be. So the main cases that come to mind, in my opinion, where I don't think you'll find a good alternate, are things like this. It's pretty hard to beat that. I know people like to do this trick, but... Um, I don't know if I even did that right. Oh yeah, like this one. So for the dot, people like to do that. But I mean, that's very clearly slower than just a 3 mover, so like, I really... I, I don't see it as a valuable trick. And then another F4 case that comes to mind is this one. I know there are some alternates, but in general it's it's very hard to execute anything as fast as that. So those are like some cases where I don't think Max will find an easy alternate. Other than that, he'll have to find out in his own time. And for a decent amount of F12 cases, there will be an alternate he can do about as fast that does an alternate EO. Um, so yeah, that being said, he doesn't have to be super duper literal about this, so if he's executing an EO alternative like 0.05 slower, that doesn't mean you have to throw it out necessarily. Uh, if it's like 0.3 slower, that's when it gets a little dicey for me personally. Um, he can he can set his own standards for this. My standard is if it's 0.2 slower, it's borderline worth it, and any worse than that, and it's just too dicey to realistically consider. Um, so yeah, the reason for this point in particular is that with him doing last pair so weirdly on, I think it was his last solve, and then along with him like missing Sledge before that pair, I think this part of solving... I think getting this part of solving up to scratch would effectively give him the same solving style he currently has, but like an enhanced version of it. So I don't think implementing these algs in particular would really change his solving style, because he's clearly taking EO into account. I don't know if he necessarily takes EO into account on pair 3, but on pair 4 he definitely seems to take it into account. 
I would recommend him to start thinking about EO for pair 3 or even pair 2. Um, pair 2 is pretty rare, but some, if there's nothing that you can really work with, then it can be necessary. But yeah, that's, that's kind of my suggestion for him. And in general, when I'm coaching anyone, whether it be Max Park or someone who averages 12, I do try to cater to a person's solving style as much as I can when giving advice, because the thing with overhauling someone's entire solving style is, yeah, maybe it sometimes is necessary, and I will say sometimes it is necessary, but anytime you're overhauling someone's solving style, it's without a doubt like one of the most time-consuming things you can do for improvement, so I really, really do try to avoid that point unless it is absolutely, absolutely necessary. So that's my first little improvement plan for Max. It mostly focuses on F12, but it can technically be applied to all four pillars of um, CFOP. So I wanted to work on F12 doing certain cases more efficiently depending on the angle and also more efficiently depending on EO. And he can do this. I think the most fun way for Max to do this would be watching example solves from fast people and just implementing a bunch of stuff, which has the added benefit of giving him some new ideas for cross, OLL, and PLL. So that's thing number one. Now we're gonna get into part two of the improvement plan. Okay, on to phase two of the three phase improvement plan. Now, for Max Park specifically, again, because he is a more interesting case study, I'm gonna be more or less combining phases two and three together. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's kind of hard to talk about one without also talking about the other. So this is kind of one of those rare instances where they get the combined, but just because it's one phase instead of two in terms of the discussion does not mean it's any easier to implement. Just because it's not, just because it's two phases instead of three doesn't mean it's easier to implement. And generally speaking, if I provide someone a two phase plan instead of a three phase plan, it'll be because phase two has multiple aspects to it and is also very dense and hard to implement. So back to before, I mentioned before that Max is very good at the four pillars of CFOP and that if he continues to only use those basic four pillars, which he does, his improvement is only going to really go so far. So it may be contra slightly contrary to what I said earlier about ZBLL being time consuming or like have to file ZBLL under time consuming but minimal reward. You've got to understand this is one of those rare instances where I have to give a tip like this and please rest assured if you invest in this improvement plan yourselves, 99% of you are not going to get me telling you to learn ZBLL or VLS or anything like that. Um, if you're averaging like 8 seconds or above, I guarantee there's 3 things that are not like super dense alg related that you can work on. And that's speaking from experience. So. Anyways, all that being said, how much faster at 3x3 do you think Max can possibly get with just OLL and PLL, along with the few LL tricks he knows? I've had a few people in the comments telling me that this is Max's style and I, you know, shouldn't try and suggest these sorts of things because he's not capable of learning them. I know that's a load of crap. I spent close to a week at Max's house, I've seen how he solves, I know how he operates, and I know enough to believe that he's capable of learning more Alps. So, he can obviously work on his F12, like I mentioned, but when it comes to cross plus one, his inspection, it's pretty on point for the most part. And ironically, that's something I tell 99% of people who get an improvement plan for me to work on. So if you want free advice, that's probably the most free advice you're going to get. Chances are your inspection is not that good and you need to actively work on it. However, since Max has great inspection and very little to improve on his F12, although a little bit to improve, Something kinda has to give in regards to his last spot, last layer game. So because of this, I'm gonna divide this last phase of the improvement plan into 2A and 2B rather than, you know, 2 and 3, because it's once again hard to discuss one without discussing the other. I'll also be going over... Um, although it's two, like, sides of it, I'm also gonna be going over, like, three ALG sets throughout this whole thing, so... Depending on how you interpret it, I'm technically giving him a four-phase improvement plan, but in this case I think it is somewhat necessary because it's hard to know what will be best for Max. Um, ultimately he'll have to put in the work and you know see what he's capable of and what's just too tall of an order. So 
call it a two phase improvement plan, call it a four phase improvement plan, you get the idea. So anyways, let's get onto it. Oh, and one more thing I, I forgot to mention. So I'll just go over this really quick. As much, as much as I appreciate solvers like Max Park and Colin Burns for providing, or not providing, rather proving how far you can get with just basic CFOP, I really, I really want to emphasize that people like Max Park and Colin Burns are outliers when it comes to cubers. 99% of cubers are going to need to take their LSLL more seriously before they're at the level of Colin Burns was or the level Max Park is. I would guess, and this is once again based off experience, that cubers typically stall and plateau anywhere from around low 8 to mid 9 seconds, depending on their TPS cap capabilities and also depending on their style of solving. So for cubers like those that I just mentioned who are like, you know, low 8 to mid 9 seconds and just use basic CFOP, people like Max Park and Colin Burns kind of become subpar role models when it comes to breaking that plateau, simply because their level of TPS and look ahead is definitely in the territory of gifted and outlier-ish rather than raw develop skill, although they undeniably have both. This might be disappointing to hear, in fact it probably is disappointing to hear because you don't like learning algs, and I still believe that hard work does beat talent when talent doesn't work hard, but at the same time I would be a fool to say that cubing is all skill and zero talent. If you watch how Max and Colin used to solve back when they were say a few seconds slower, you'll kind of get what I mean about the gifted side of things, and what I mean about their look ahead and TPS kind of being just naturally better than yours probably will be. So anyways, because Max has maxed out, I love that pun, on his OLL and PLL, for the most part, he's got to commit to learning a big ALG set that will improve his times. That being said, out of the big ALG sets that are available for advanced CFOP, there isn't really one that he's going to learn and implement that will show up in every single solve, let alone even most solves. So it therefore has to be something kind of extreme that still shows up enough to be worthwhile. The three ALG sets, in my opinion, that are going to fulfill this need the best are OLLCP, and OLLCP, it's not actually that extreme, but also the benefits are a lot less. So there's OLLCP, there's VLS, and then there's ZBLL. However, I'm not just going to say, who do learn all three, and just call it a day, because it is a more nuanced topic. And like I said earlier, I really try my best to prioritize my suggestions in terms of return on investment. So we have to choose an ALG set that's worth learning first and leave the other two for later. So first one I'm going to talk about is OLLCP because I think that's by far the easiest one to implement, but it's also probably going to give you the least benefits uh, long term. Short term it'll probably give you more benefits than things like VLS and ZBLL, but that just kind of comes down to the nature of them taking a long time to implement. But we'll get to that when we get to that. So OLLCP, those unaware, uh, OLLCP is just OLL, but you also use CP recognition, or CLL style recognition if you've ever solved 2x2, two two, to also use an alternate ALG and solve the CP at the same time. So in this case, we have these two coals opposite and these two coals opposite, so instead of using my normal ALG, which would give me an R-perm, I can use this OLLCP and get a U-perm. So that's one way you can use OLLCP. Another way that not enough people talk about, but I think is absolutely, absolutely worth it. And we'll just set up a case here. Um, so here's one here. And we recognize that these two are opposites and these two are solved. And again, the standard ALG will give Diag. There is this kind of weird, awkward, fat ALG, but I don't really like, which gives a U-perm. Another way you can use it instead is to not only just force EPLLs, but also avoid Diag. So here I would use that ALG I used previously and get T-perm, which although maybe isn't quite as good as U-perm, it's a lot less of an awkward ALG to get to this PLL. And a lot of the Adj corner swap PLLs are like pretty on par with EPLLs in general. And then things like Z-perm and H-perm are just kind of like, eh, depending on the person. So that's more or less the two ways people generally use OLLCP, and that is how I would suggest Max to use it. So, yeah, that's that's more or less... that's more or less how you use OLLCP. And the key thing to note about OLLCP is that you don't need to learn a whole lot of it to get most of the benefits. And so much so that I think even learning one alternate for most OLLs will be enough to get those benefits. So that's like, realistically like 50 to 60 algs. 
which compared to VLS, which is about 200, and then ZB, which is in like the 400 territory, this is obviously a lot, a lot easier to implement. And this is why I'm mentioning it first. So, some LLs you don't really want to learn an alternate for. Let's take Furoff, for example. What's going to be faster than Furoff? And this once again goes to the thing I mentioned before, where um, you want your algs, you want your alternate fancy algs to be at a comparable speed to your standard algs, because otherwise you might not be actually getting any benefits. So for something like Furoff, you might be able to find some sort of alternate alg, but it's likely not as fast as Furoff. And again, with the Edge PLLs, they're really not that bad. Um, Something like this, for example, people might want to do this to go from Diag to EPLL, but again, Furoff is like 0.5, and if you can't do that alg I just showed you in like 0.7, I highly, highly doubt it's worth it. So that's one example, but on the flip side, there are some other OLLs. So like this, for example, the Awkward Shapes, there's many, many alternate OLLs that I think are, or OLLCPs rather, that I think are worth implementing. So there's like Soon Furoff, um... And then there's like double sledge like that for the no swap. Um, and then there's this one, which is kind of checkered. That one's pretty good as well. So it's it's very case dependent. In general, though, you want to have one alternate for most OLLs. If it's a crappy OLL, you don't want an alternate. And when I say crappy, I mean I, I guess I should say good OLL. If it's a really good OLL, like Fat, Anti, Soon, or Fru Rough, you're not going to find a great alternate. And then if it's like a crappy OLL that's like an awkward shape, you can realistically find like two, three, or four that are worth learning. So that's kind of my plan for OLL CPs. And again, you can find these on, I believe, algdv.net. And again, you can find them passively through watching walkthrough solves. Um, you can learn a lot from walkthrough solves. It's a great, great way to practice, actually. Um... But uh, yeah, so like I mentioned previously, make sure that you're actually getting the benefits from it by timing your algs. Because if you don't time your algs, then if it's if it just so happens to be like a two second alg that and you don't realize it, then you're not really getting the benefits. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk very briefly about my way of um, I guess my like time standards for OLCPs, and then I'll move on to VLS. So. If it's an OLLCP where you're avoiding a potential diag and instead giving yourself an EPLL, that is the only case where I think the OLLL can be a little bit slower. So like I mentioned before, if for whatever reason you really don't want to do YPerm or VPerm or ERN, which is fairly reasonable, and you can execute that in like 0.7, that might be worth it for you. But I, I have yet to find someone who can execute that ALG that quickly, so yeah. So that's case one, where you're avoiding Diag and getting EPLL. For the other two cases, where if you're avoiding Adge and going into EPLL, it's got to be the same speed. Even 0.1 slower, I'm like, nah, not worth it. And then if you're avoiding a Diag, but only getting an Adge, once again, it kind of has to be the same speed. I think, here's kind of the way I like would put the PLLs in a tier list in terms of like CP. So down here we have like, or I should say up here is like EPLL is the best, and then Adge is like just a bit under it, and then Diag is like down here. So Diag is pretty bad in general, Wiperm is kind of the only really good one. So if you're avoiding Diag and getting Adge, it has to be the same speed for the most part, but like with a little asterisk, so it could be like 0.1 slower and then I could maybe see it being worth it, but you really don't want to go that much beyond that. So that's, that's kind of my little spiel on OLCP and how I think Max could and should implement it. And the only prerequisite that I think may be an issue for Max is learning CP recognition. Uh, he's obviously not a 2x2 solver, and although I've seen him use some ZBLLs, I don't know if he's necessarily using proper CP recognition for them. So that would be the only prerequisite, but other than that, he could absolutely implement, you know, again, like 50 to 60 nice OLL CPs into his solves in, like, a matter of weeks pretty easily. And he wouldn't... and he'd be seeing improvements in his solves pretty quickly after that as well. So I think that's, I think out of the three ALK sets, OLLCP is by far the quickest to implement, but unfortunately you don't quite get as many benefits as VLS and ZBLL, but that's actually okay. It's not a bad thing, it's just that it's a little bit different. 
So that's OLLCP. Now we'll talk a little bit about VLS. So VLS, for those of you who don't know, it's when you're... Uh, I don't know how to set things up. So it's when you've got the FR pair ready to insert in the FR slot with U, R, U prime, R prime. But instead of doing that, you use an algorithm that forces an OLL skip. And you can do this for other slots as well, but for the purposes of this discussion, we will just be talking about the front right slot. Okay, so why is VLS so good? Well, in my opinion, the recognition is as easy as standard OLL recognition or at the very least close enough that recognition shouldn't be an issue long term. And once again, I don't see why this would be a problem for someone like Max Park and his style, quote unquote, that people love to talk about, because his style involves recognizing OLLs and recognizing VLSs is very similar, so I don't know why that goes against his style and I don't know why people think that. People are dumb. Anyways, so with the recognition being pretty easy, I think well, I mean, we'll talk, we won't talk about recognition anymore. We'll talk about the other aspect of it. So recognition aside, uh, let's see. We'll just set up a RAM case. So if recognition aside, we'll talk about the efficiency of VLS. So it's always going to be the most efficient option for dealing with that pair and OLL at the same time. So this is within the framework of trying to solve the last pair and the OLL. When you take things into account like ZBLL, then the... Uh, the risk reward gets a bit different, but in terms of just purely trying to solve your last pair and OLL, if that's all you care about, VLS will be the most efficient option. And worst case scenario, the best VLS alg will just be an insert into OLL. So for example here, you may not like doing double sexy like that, and you might find you're able to do this faster. But guess what, you can recognize, you can recognize this Probably about as quickly as you can recognize something like this. You may be more used to recognizing something like this, and that's why you think OLL recognition is easier, but when you've practiced both, you will realize that the recognition is pretty much the same. So given the fact that the recognition is so similar, uh, VLS is always going to be the most efficient option. Worst case scenario, you use an insert into OLL, and all you've done is displace your recognition from during OLL to before OLL. And then the best case scenario is that you actually save a lot of moves and you get to PLL a lot more efficiently than you would have. So, in my opinion, VLS is quite literally always worth it when you're working within that framework of just solve F12 and solve OLL. If you're trying to solve more things like CP, uh, ZBLL, one look last layer, stuff like that, it gets a bit muddy. But for just OLL, definitely work it. worth it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so compared to ZBLL, VLS is a lot easier to recognize. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me on that. There's less algorithms to learn by a long shot because it's 216 versus... I think it's like 493, but if we just pretend the stones don't exist, which, I mean, they basically don't, it's really like 328. And the algorithms themselves, this is another thing I forgot to mention. The algorithms for VLS are actually really easy. Comparatively... They're a lot easier in terms of like low move count and complicated moves and solutions when compared to something like ZBLL. So between VLS and ZBLL, this is kind of where like the real debate of which one to learn first is. I think OLLCP would be the one Max tackles first just because it's so easy and I think there's very little doubt about how worthwhile it is, whereas VLS and ZBLL, you'll see a bit later that it gets a bit complicated. So I'll give my final verdict on that once I've explained a bit more about ZBLL. But VLS, when compared to ZBLL, is without a doubt easier to learn. Also, probably, I would say definitely faster to implement, actually. And it also shows up more frequently when transitioning from pure CFOP, coming up in about, I would say, one in four solves in my experience. Um, again, if you're not using basic CFOP and you're using a lot of EO, then ZBLL may be more common, but this is not how Max solves. So within this framework... VLS is more common, easier algs, easier recognition, quicker to implement. There's a lot more benefits to it. So, that's VLS. Now, for ZBLL, for those who don't know, that's when... Let's set up a random case. So, it's when you have an LL case where all of your edges are oriented. Technically, there are 493 algorithms, but if we remove the standard PLLs, which technically get filed under ZBLL, and I'm pretty sure Max knows those. 
along with the relatively useless soons and anti soons, the number drops drastically all the way down to 328, which cuts about a third of the total owl count. And what makes ZBLL so good is a lot more obvious than what makes VLS good, because instead of doing an OLL alg and a PLL alg, you do a ZB alg. One alg is quicker than two algs. <laughs> that's, that's more or less the math there, and then the only other thing to take into account is recognition, which we'll get to in a sec. The last thing is on top of that, it isn't 2009 anymore, so we actually have good alg resources for ZB now. They're not perfect, but they're pretty damn good. If you go on algdb.net, uh, they've got both VLS and ZBLL, and I think they're generally pretty good. I think they can definitely be improved, but we're definitely doing a lot better in terms of the algs available than we were, you know, back in the, the good old days. <clears throat> okay. So, even though I think ZBLL would be very good for Max, how he goes about implementing ZBLL is something I feel like he would have to be very calculated with in order to not slow himself down too much in the long term. And for this reason, combined with the algorithm and recognition learning curve being measurably worse, on top of ZBLL being less common than VLS, when transitioning from pure CFOP... God damn it, that phone's going. I gotta close this door. Sorry about that, fellas. Uh, but yeah, basically for all those reasons and more, I would prioritize learning VLS before learning ZBLL for ease reasons and just for... Yeah, just for that, basically. It's easy to implement. Kind of similar benefits to ZBLL in terms of time drop, but because it's easier, it's probably the one to do first. So, now that we have that established, I'm going to break down how I would suggest learning, practicing, and implementing both of these slightly more dense ALG sets, which... Oh, well, LCP, I don't think it really interferes with them, but these two, they can, they can kind of interfere with each other. <clears throat> so, for VLS, there are eight EO subject, subject, subsets, which each contain 27 algorithms. If we were to further divide these algs into smaller chunks, we would do so by a number of oriented corners. So, effectively, the more oriented corners, the easier the recognition, although not by much. Anywho, within the each 27 ALG set, there is one three-corner case, so let's bust out the old cube again. So this will be a three-corner case, so there's one of these for all eight EOs, and then there's six, uh, six two-corner cases. And this is again by number of oriented corners, so this would be a two-corner case. And then three-corner cases... Um, Oh no, we already did three corner cases, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. So there's one three corner, there's six two corner cases, there's twelve one corner cases, and then finally there is eight zero corner cases. And these ones are, I would say these are the, one, the only ones that are even remotely tricky to recognize because you have to look at the sides as opposed to on top, and you also have to deal with kind of kooky combinations of CO that you might not be familiar with. Um... But yeah, that's basically how, how much you can divide it. You can divide it into eight EO sets and then further divide it to small subsets that range from about uh, 12 cases to one. And generally they're around like six or eight. So with that said, what do I think is the best order to learn them in? Well, first we'll talk out within the context of EO. So with the eight EO sub subsets, I would say that the all edges oriented and the no edges oriented cases they are a nice place to start, because when you set up your last pair in a 3x3 solve, these two sets <clears throat> pardon me, are much easier to look ahead to when compared to the remaining six. And what I mean by that is when you're pairing this up, because you see all three of these, it's very easy to know you're getting a winter variation. And inversely, uh, when you have no edges oriented, it's very easy to see you're getting no edges oriented. So I think those two are good to learn first. Other than that, you may want to learn UF right after, so, um, I don't know how to set things up, whatever, um, something like that. So, the reason it might be good to learn UF is kind of similar to the previous case where you might be familiar with, for example, seeing this setup and knowing it'll go into sludge because of this. Uh, another example, maybe something like this. Maybe you've seen this case a lot and you know it goes into sledge. So that's another reason why you may want to learn UF before other cases, because that'll make the implementation side of things a little bit easier. But 
Otherwise, really you can learn the last five to six EOKs in any order you want. And with the first two of Winter Variation and Dot, like you don't have to learn the first, I just think they will probably be easy to implement for most people, and then the Sledge is like another unique case where it may or may not be easy to easier to implement for some people. Now the other thing to take into account is how quickly you learn algs or like to learn algs. This will affect how often and how much you learn each EO set. So I think most cubers could handle learning an EO set in three days. Uh, that's all 27 algs, so that would be nine algs a day on average. And it divides the four CO sets nicely since one of the sets is only one alg, so you can... That, that set alone should not take you a whole day. That should take, you know, like 20 minutes or something. But it depends, obviously. So that being said, if you can handle learning more cases, learn more cases. Um, that's pretty much all I'm kind of saying here. And once you complete any EO set, there is an excellent way you can drill these cases, because implementing them in your actual solves is one thing, but because they won't be coming up that much at first because you don't know enough VLS, you will want to actually drill them in your own time, and there is a good way to do it. So basically all you do is you use ZVLL scrambles in QQ timer, CS timer, whatever timer, and you just do that scramble, let's say it does this, and then you take the pair out. And if you want to work on wound variation, you would do that. If you want to work on UF, you would do that. If you want to work on dot, um, you would do that. Well, left D, but you get the idea. So that's how you drill VLS effectively, and if Max were to learn VLS, this is what I would suggest he do. Um, find out how much he can learn a day, prioritize the ones he learns based on the ones that'll probably be easiest to implement, and then drill them with ZB scrambles and uh, certain inserts to set up. Okay, so once you're a little over halfway done with VLS, so once you've learned about four of the EO sets, maybe a bit more, you could also start supplementing your drilling practice with full-on LL scrambles, so it won't always have EO, so it could be something like this. And then just following with RUR prime every time. Just be aware that you're going to encounter VLS cases you don't know from drilling this way, and we'll want to do an immediate sexy move when this happens for the sake of drilling what you're supposed to be drilling. So let's say we haven't learned these cases yet. So if this pops up, you just go, oh, you do that. And then, oh, it's a case I do know. So that's more or less how that works. Um, the sexy move trick doesn't work for the dot or winter variation EO sets, however. So that's another reason to learn those two first. But if it's any of the two edge cases like these, then a sexy move will... It'll give you something you can hopefully work with if you're past the halfway point. If you do insist on learning a different order, you could replace sexy move with... Um, I mean, I'll just set up EO first. Uh, so let's say, for whatever reason, you're drilling VLS in this way and you don't know when to variation. Well, you could do something like Sledge, or you could do this over and over until you get something. So there are workarounds, but I, I would still suggest learning when to variation pretty early on, and then the dots also, for those reasons. Once you know full VLS, then you can absolutely do LL scrambles and then just a sexy move, and that is a killer way to drill VLS in my opinion, because you get all the sets, you're never going to encounter anything you don't know, and it's just a good time. Okay, so that's almost everything to do with VLS, I promise I'm nearly done. One other thing you can do that may help with implementing VLS into your souls is actually learning tricks to force an FR pair. And this is kind of a, this is an interesting one. So let's take this pair for example, most people would think, oh you solve it like that, and then uh, VLS in the back. How I solve it? Is like that, and then I have VLS in the front, and then I can do the wrong out on camera because I suck. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's another way you can uh, help implementing VLS into your solves is learning tricks that force an FR pair. Here's, here's like another one. People might rotate and do lefty like that, or you could do Fura from here, and then luckily I know this VLS case. So yeah, that's something you can do that will help learning VLS in your actual solves, because once again, drilling is one thing, but actually doing a solve and being there in the heat of the moment and implementing new algs is a lot harder in my opinion. That being said, you can absolutely go overboard with learning these types of tricks where you force FR, and you could also develop some bad habits. So these types of tricks, although they're not entirely useless, you can get pretty ridiculous with them, and I actually was guilty of this myself in the past. Because the point of VLS, at the end of the day, the point of VLS 
is to make yourselves where you naturally end with an FR pair a little faster. You're not trying to make VLS your new method. You're trying to supplement your normal CFOP solves and when you happen to run into a case where building an FR pair is just naturally efficient, you'll be able to capitalize a lot better. So I don't think about forcing FR pair anymore. I just focus on doing F12 as fast as possible. And if I run into a VLS, then that's just gravy. But earlier on, if you're having tr like super bad trouble with implementing VLS, that can be something that you do. So that's everything to do with VLS. That's the order I would learn them in. That's how I would chunk them up. That's how I would drill them. And hopefully with all of that, that gives Max or anyone else who wants to implement this advice a actual framework to work with. So now that we've gone over all of that, we're going to talk a bit about ZBLL. Now onto learning ZBLL, phase three of the improvement plan, or close enough to it, I, I can't keep track. <laughs> so like with VLS, we have to first establish an order and way of learning ZBLL, and then a means of drilling what we've already learned in order to effectively retain everything to a high enough level to then effectively implement everything into real souls over time. ZBLL is a pain in the ass. Believe me, I've done it. It sucks. Well, I haven't done soons, but I have a reason for that. We'll get into that. So, first of the order, I'm going to categorize the seven sets into a tier list based on how quote-unquote worth it they are for 3x3 speed solves. In the most worthwhile category, we have U and T. This is a U case with headlights. This is a T case where they kind of stick out to the sides. These make up two of... or two of the three two corner sets. The other one being L, which we will talk about in a sec because it is the next one on the tier list. Anyways, having two oriented corners helps a lot with recognition because blocks and patterns are generally more relatable to PLL. So for example, because all of this here is solved, we can... It's, it's not necessarily better rec... I, I think it is slightly better recognition, but it might not necessarily be. I just think it's a lot more relatable to PLL. And that's pretty much why it can be easier to learn and implement these cases for a lot of people. And yeah, so because there's that little bit of information that looks a lot like PLL, this does help a lot with the learning curve for U and T. And it makes those a lot easier than other sets because you have, once again, this solved two by three block. And as such, most of the U and T cases are going to feel like PLL recognition just with added CP recognition, because again, that is a prerequisite. But other than the CP recognition, it just kind of looks PLL-ish. So that's the first tier. That's the, that's the two definitely worthwhile ones, or the most worthwhile. Just below U and T in the very worthwhile category, but not quite as good as U and T, we have L. So L, it's a two-corner case. It's the third two-corner case. However, these blocks are a bit more separated now, as you can see. That being said, the recognition will still be pretty easy to pick up for most people. Maybe not quite as easy as UNT due to them having bigger blocks, but still, the L set doesn't have a steep learning curve, in my opinion, if you've learned UNT. Um, yeah, because you have this block to work with, or you have this block to work with. Um, generally, people pick one over the other when they're um, recognizing ZB, but you can technically choose both and... In my opinion, just the algorithms themselves are pretty good. So those are the three sets that I will say are without a doubt worth it. And although Max doesn't have to learn all of T, U, and L, I would encourage him to do so if he wants to be a faster cuber. Now we're getting into the borderline kind of fishy territory with the last four. Um, we'll, call, we'll call this the eventually worthwhile category where it'll be worthwhile once the algs are better developed but right now it just has a couple issues. So in the eventually worthwhile category, we have the we have the H case. And this one stays by itself and it's not with Pi. Um, Pi is kind of in a tier its own and I'll explain. So the main uh, what was I gonna say? Okay, so the reason H is a bit better than Pi. They both have the same learning curve issue in that you have to really start making use of non-PLL style recognition techniques. So that is true for both H and Pi. That being said, H is unique in that it's the only set out of the seven that isn't 72 algs. H is only 48 algs. 
and it's also only four CP subsets versus six CP subsets. So it makes learning and implementing H quite a lot easier than Pi. Uh, unfortunately, that does not necessarily make H worth it. And I'll make I'll make a video on this subject in the future because I think it is important. But in general, the recognition is a bit iffy. Some of the algs really aren't that great, and at the end of the day, if you're taking like two and a half seconds to do a ZB rather than two and a half seconds to do all on PLL, the recognition is going to be the deciding factor. Um, and sometimes the recognition is so bad that there's just even more time added. So even if you can do the ALG in like 1.8 seconds, it doesn't really doesn't really make the world a difference. So H H is in the territory where if Max is really 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 ambitious, he could choose to learn it. However, I would for the most part just recommend he learn TU and L. Um, and then just below that in the also not really worth it but could be in the long term is pi. So it has all the same drawbacks of H with, you know, steeple learning curve for recognition, but instead of there being four CPs, there are now six, and instead of there being 48 algs to learn, there are 72 algs to learn. So if, if Max were to grind out and learn T, U, and L, I think that would without a doubt make him faster. If he also wanted to grind out H and Pi, although I think that would be really cool, I don't necessarily think him learning H and Pi would make his solves faster. And yeah, so for the rest of this discussion, I'll mainly be talking about TU and L, although I will mention a bit of um, H and Pi just because I think there could be some benefits to learning some of the two GLLs and dyad cases. Uh, lastly, I guess I'll talk about the soons, if, if I absolutely have to. Um, <laughs> so soon. Recognition isn't that bad because we've got this block, just like with L. However, there is only one, so sometimes the combinations can be really crap. On top of that, the CP recognition is the worst of, in my opinion, all of the uh, OLL cases in this ZB subset. And on top of that, the standard OLL ARG is by far the fastest for soon and anti-soon. And the fact that the ALG is just that ridiculously fast means when we play the whole game of can you do the ZB as fast as your standard ALG and can you recognize it as fast as the standard OLL, you realize you would have to be saving a ridiculous amount of time with your ALG in order for it to be worth it given how good PLL as a whole is. In my opinion, any truly high level Q should be able to do every PLL under like 1.2, without a doubt. So soon, anti-soon, I really just don't think they're worth it. Maybe in like the super duper long term where we've like mastered all the algs and everything, but then even then there is one case where I think soon is not worth it. And this is just an interesting one I'll talk about now, and that is when you're um That's when you're inserting your last pair and you've predicted that you'll get a soon. So like I see this and I know I just do U prime soon. Is doing U prime and then recognize and then do a crap alg really gonna be better than just insert into OLL. In my opinion, it won't be, even if we perfect the algs, because that kind of recognition I did just then, for high level cubers, um, it is very unconscious. Like, I could very realistically be solving at full speed and then see that pattern and know I'm gonna get a soon. So, that's, that's kind of my spiel on the order of learning ZBLLs, and the ZBLLs I would be kind of wary of. So now we'll talk a bit about uh, what we do after we start learning them. Okay, so now that we've established an intelligent order to learn ZB in, how should Max learn each of the seven sets? Once again, it will depend on how fast he learns ALGs, but ZBLL ALGs are definitely harder than VLS ALGs, so we're not going to really breeze through as quickly as we did before. In my opinion, it is a lot easier to learn big, big chunks of VLS at any given time. Um, ZBLL, not so much, um, just because the algs are harder, the recognition's worse, and the alg sets are bigger. So naturally, drilling and implementing just becomes harder. So, that being said, the only real way to divide the sets further, in my opinion, is by COLL type. Each of the seven sets has a diag swap and a no swap CP set. Diag swap being something like, um, something like this. This would be a diag L case. And then there's also the no swap, which, would look like this. It looks similar, but different. So each, yeah, each of the seven sets, they have a diagonal no swap, and then they have some edge sets. So for non-H ZBLL sets, 
there will be 12 algs per set. And then the other four sets, once again, like I said, there'll be some sort of adjacent swap. Basically, my suggestion we learn one CLL at a time, which may or may not be doable in a day, or maybe will take a week, but again, just... All, all I ask when it comes to like how fast you should learn algs is learn as fast as you think you can learn them. Basically, just don't get lazy on me. Like, do try to push yourself and see what you can really retain. Um... Because I think learning algs is a skill that you can develop if you really want to. And once you, so once you've learned at least one CLL set, Roman Strakov has an amazing, amazing website for drilling ZBLL. And I would highly recommend anyone even remotely interested in ZBLL, even if it's just learning like three or four little CLL sets, check out the link in the description or in the comments or someone else posting it because I forgot. Uh, but yeah, Roman Strakov's site is amazing, and it is very, very easy to use for drilling the smallest amounts of ZBLL all the way up to the whole damn thing. So, love that website. And that is how I'll recommend Max Park drill any ZB. <sighs> okay, from there, everything is relatively obvious and similar to before. Learn the algs, and then drill them, and then learn a bit more, and then drill a bit more. And then once you know a whole 72 alg set, drill that larger set. I didn't mention this before, but I feel like it should be obvious. I wouldn't recommend learning a CLL set from T and then one from U. I would recommend trying to complete all of T first before trying to learn much of U. You can learn them like at the same time, but I think you wanna you wanna have the goal in mind of completing sets. So yeah. The CLL order you choose within those sets doesn't really matter. However, because Max is also very good and very interested in one-handed solving. I would say that the no swap CP cases are super super good for OH. Well, I guess this is just called 2GLL, but yeah, the 2GLL cases, very 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 nice one ander because they have 2 gen turning and it's just a very good time and you get fast solves with it. The diag swap CP cases don't necessarily have juicy OH algs. That being said, the optimal OH OLL usually is something 2 gen which will lead to more ENV Y perms. And those are a lot worse for one ender than they are two ended, in my opinion. Especially if the Alex Max uses. But anyways, so learning in the order of no swap to diag swap to all the adj ones could be good for that reason. Otherwise, it really doesn't matter and your gut instinct on the order you choose will most likely be valid. Now, you would think that my analysis would be done by now, since I've given Max an outline for improving his F2L, as well as learning and implementing OLLCP, VLS, and ZBLL. Well, unfortunately, there is one last thing we got to mention in the event that Max does, in fact, learn all of the above. And this is kind of what I was alluding to before with how VLS and ZBLL can interfere with each other. So, I mentioned earlier in the F12 section that Max doesn't really need to learn too many EO tricks overall. And that is true if he wants to stick to a more basic CFOP solving style, which is absolutely fine. And I think there are efficiencies he can implement into that regardless. But if for whatever reason he wants to learn the best three of the seven sets of ZBLL or even more than that, then ZBLS becomes significantly more worthwhile. How worthwhile it becomes will scale such that as he learns a little ZBLL, a little more ZBLS will be useful. And as he learns a lot more ZBLL, a lot more ZBLS will be useful. So with this in mind, I would encourage him to learn a few new ZBLS cases for every X number of ZBs he learns. And the rate at which he does this really doesn't matter too much as long as he remembers to keep in mind that a ZBLS solution that takes twice as long as a normal pants solution probably won't be worth it. But beyond that, you can you can have a little bit of leeway, and I'll let Max set his own standards on that one. Um, realistically, most OLL to PLL solutions are going to take a little under three seconds, and although ZBLL saves time, it won't save much more than a second. If that, uh most of the time, in my opinion. So you really have to vet carefully when it comes to ZBLS so you can learn and implement effectively. But as he's learning ZBLL, should he choose to, I would also recommend for every X cases, maybe for like every CLL subset, you learn like two new ZBLS cases just for fun. I think that can be a nice little break from it as well because ZBLL algs, in my opinion, are a lot more complex than ZBLS algs. And just learning complex algs over and over could get a bit monotonous for someone like Max. So having something else to like fall back on with some slightly easier, slightly more fun ZBLS cases that are a fair bit easier to implement, 
I think it'd be good for like a just, you know, just kind of a pacing standpoint. Like you might not want to just kind of slug it out and just really, really grind. So that's that. The other thing, the other consideration rather we have to make, and this is more getting into the VLS versus ZBLL stuff. This is namely to do with winter variation. So uh, cases like these and then the sledge ones or UF, sorry, which are these sorts of cases. They tend to become a lot less worthwhile when you can just do a quick insert into ZB. For example, here I could just do a quick sledge into a quick ZB. So for this reason, I would encourage Max to quote unquote, unlearn a number of these VLS cases, except for the very few fast cases. So things like, like this one, where you can just do, if you recognize this, M prime insert will be better than sledge ZB. But for everything else, I would, I would suggest learning which inserts force better ZBLLs, or at the very least, which which inserts force ZBLLs, which is usually just sledge. Um, this point is more to do with like random cases like these. Like for example, here, this probably isn't a great example, but I'll just show it anyway. Um, instead of forcing an L case, which is pretty good, you can technically force a U case, which is a little bit better. That wasn't the best example because I think you would just want to take the L there, uh, no pun intended, but um, there are other cases where, although you can do RU prime R prime to force a ZB, doing U RU to R prime can force a better ZB, and likewise with the sledge cases. Um, I'll, I'll make a video on this topic in the future because I think it is pretty interesting, but uh, basically the bottom line is with the whole VLS and ZB thing interacting with each other, you will unfortunately have to unlearn a little bit of VLS, but it really isn't that bad, and all things considered, it does tend to work out pretty well. So that's my imp three three phase improvement plan for Max Park. That's how I would suggest you work on his F12 a little bit, along with the other pillars of CFOP at the same time through example solves and also actual alk hunting through AlkDV. And on top of that, I've also mentioned how he could implement OLLCP as a nice supplement to his already basic but effective CFOP style of solving. And then on top of that, I've also suggested how he could learn a more dense subset like VLS or ZBLL while still effectively implementing it into his solving style. So now with all that said, let's get to a bit of an outro, shall we? <sighs> all right, that was, that was a mouthful. If you made it through this entire series, regardless of whether or not you enjoyed it or got something useful out of it. I do want to thank you for taking the time to watch it. I really do appreciate it. Uh, on top of that, I do have one last little bit of an announcement. So I did allude very early in the series that I would be providing a cheaper alternative to the 50 USD improvement plan. I will say that I still think the 50 USD improvement plan is worth its price, if not maybe a bit underpriced, because depending on the kind of solver you are, you can very realistically be given an improvement plan that takes more than three months to fully implement. For example, in the case of Max Park, I think everything I mentioned would take him like six months to a year to implement. This isn't necessarily the case for anyone who averages like eight to ten. Usually you don't have to work quite as hard. But yeah, in general, with the three-phase improvement plan, you are being given a lot of work to do that will take a number of months. But the result of all that effort is basically you're given basically like three months worth of near-optimal practice advice where for the next couple of months you can rest assured that the practice that you're doing is definitely going to make you faster whether or not you're really seeing the results short term. So the price is going to stay for those 50 USD three phase improvement plans which also have an average of five reconstruction included. However, I do want to provide a cheaper alternative because there are some people who just can't afford it which is absolutely understandable. So I have two new options, one is 30 USD and the other is 20 USD. So for 30 USD, I will provide a two-phase improvement plan, which also includes one solve reconstructed and nitpicked. So you still send me an average of five and I still send you a two-phase improvement plan, but you can choose one solve out of the average of five that I will reconstruct in my own time and, you know, nitpick. And then the 20 USD option will be a one-phase improvement plan with no reconstruction work done at all. So although you send me an average of five, I'm not going to reconstruct the solves, although I would appreciate having the scrambles just so I can look through them myself. 
and I will only be providing you a one phase improvement plan, which will be what I consider to be the biggest weakness in your solves that will give you the best time improvement in a relatively short amount of time. So those are my two new options, 30 USD, you get a two phase plan with one reconstruction, or for 20 USD, you get a one phase plan with no reconstructions. So the 50 USD, three phase improvement plan with an average of five reconstructed, in my opinion, is still the best value deal without a doubt because it gives you more to work on for a number of months and it gives you four whole more solves worth of information that you can very easily relate to your own solves and think about very quickly. So that's my announcement for the improvement plans. If if you like this video, give it a like. I don't know, leave a comment telling me how sick I am. <laughs> and yeah, that's it for this series. More rambles coming soon and thank you so much for watching.